Well, welcome to church. It's so good to see each and every one of you. We begin a new series today called Almighty, and we are going to be looking at some of the foundational truths that I think every Christian, really every person, should know about Almighty God. Almighty is defined as that which is all-powerful, omnipotent, supreme, preeminent, very great. And if, if ever there was one deserving of that title, it is the Lord God Almighty. The Bible repeatedly speaks of God as the Almighty or the Almighty One. One of the first places we see it is in Genesis 17.1 when God is talking to Abraham. He said, when Abram, at, his, at the time his name was Abram, was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now here's what's interesting. The Hebrew word for God Almighty is El Shaddai. And perhaps you've heard of it, El Shaddai. Amy Grant, remember, uh, came out with a famous song back in the 70s. You guys remember this song? Many of you remember it? El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Ayana Adonai. And it literally meant God Almighty, Lord God in the highest. And it was a beautiful song. As a matter of fact, I think it was our prelude today. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful song. El Shaddai, God Almighty. Psalm 91, Greg just read this. Um, it says this, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And we see this in the New Testament too, this idea of God being the Almighty One. In Revelation 1, verse 8, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. As the Almighty One, God is the owner of all things. He is the supreme authority in all matters. He is the omnipotent King of everything seen and unseen. He is the preeminent One above all things. To put it in everyday terms, God is at the top of the food chain. He is King of the jungle. There is no one higher or more powerful or more supreme than the Lord. The psalmist talks about this in Psalm 145. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and, should, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. And I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Isn't that an amazing passage? It has, it's the psalmist is just trying to say, God, you are, you are almighty. He is just trying to put God in his place, which is exalted and high. And just every sentence that pours forth is just, Lord, you are amazing. You are great. Your fame is amazing. Your works are amazing. And I love what this passage says. One generation shall commend your works to another. And look what it says. And shall declare your mighty acts. Verse 4. And shall declare your mighty acts. Well, just how mighty are the mighty acts of Almighty God? Well, they're pretty awesome. They're pretty mighty indeed. As a matter of fact, you cannot get past page 1, verse 1. Chapter 1 of the Bible without encountering perhaps the mightiest of all of God's works, and that is the creation of the universe itself, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible, what is amazing, says all that God had to do was speak and the universe came into existence. Remember last week we talked about Jesus. He was in the garden. And all he had to do was speak his name. And the soldiers that came to arrest him drew back and fell to the ground. All God has to do is speak. And there is power behind that voice. Psalm 33 says this. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. And the, by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. By the way, what is our response to creation? The fact that God has spoken into existence everything. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. 
He gathers the waters of the sea in a heap and he puts the deeps in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. When you look at creation, you need to be reminded that God simply spoke this into existence and our response to that is utter humility. It is fear, it is reverence, and it is awe of the Almighty One that spoke this into existence. New Testament talks about this too. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. He simply said, exist, and the universe came into existence. Now listen to this. So what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now that is very important. I brought this up um, a while back. This is Latin. There's a Latin term we use to describe this. It's ex nihilo. Ex nihilo, it means out of nothing. God spoke into existence everything that you see. When I was in seminary, they said, you know, when you teach out of the Bible, make sure to give the background on the passage that you're teaching. Well, here's the background on Genesis 1.1. There was nothing. (laughs) That's the background. There was nothing. Literally, there was nothing. Nothing existed. There was no matter. There was no energy. Time did not exist. There was literally nothing. And then there was something. There was a beginning. Now, again, secular scientists, of course, they posit that the universe came into existence from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. All by itself, the universe just popped into existence and ordered itself and started to govern itself. And that life, against all mathematical odds, just happened to appear on this planet a couple billion years ago, 14 billion years ago, in a primordial soup, some amino acids just came together just right and formed the first cell. And again, despite all mathematical odds, the first single-celled life forms began to evolve into the highly developed, moral, and critical thinking humans that we are today. Now listen... Often, though, often those that reject the idea of creation, they re- God, as the Bible describes it, they reject it because they reject the idea of miracles. That's why. I don't know about you, but I think you have to believe in miracles to believe that the universe just popped into existence out of a state of nothingness, then ordered itself, started governing itself, then produced life, and that life evolved from a single cell into a fish, into a lizard, into an ape, into a hominid, and then into you. I think they're living by faith, not us. And I really do mean that. I really do mean that. That is a miracle in my book. The reality is is that the beauty, order, design of the universe screams of a creator. Now, I told you this. I I, I taught this a while back. I'm going to teach you again because you guys have to get this. You can prove that God exists to a rational person in just a matter of seconds. Okay, And you do it by this. You just tell them this. Every building has a builder. Every painting has a painter. Created things always have a creator. If I had a painting up here and I showed you this painting and I said, hey, this painting just came into existence out of nothing by itself for no purpose. And look at how beautiful it is. You would say of me, you are insane. Of course you would because you're irrational. Now, if you're talking to an irrational person and you say everything that's created has a creator, they're going to fight you on it. But they're not being rational at this point. The reality is every building has a builder. Every painting has a painter. Created things have a creator. We know and understand that. And it is ridiculous to think otherwise. And the universe that God Almighty created is infinitely more ordered and beautiful than any painting And it is infinitely more awesome than any building. Yet I'm supposed to believe this all happened by accident. For no purpose. For no reason. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, I quote it often. I know you guys are often, many of you are very familiar with that. The the Bible says that creation screams that God Almighty exists, right? For God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived. In other words, if you looked at a painting, you would clearly perceive there's a painter. If you looked at a building, you would clearly perceive that there is a builder. And the same principle applies. You look at creation, you clearly perceive. It is clearly perceived that there is someone behind it. And that someone is God Almighty. Ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. So that men are without excuse. The universe, of course, is big. It is really, really big. The universe contains 
trillions of stars, billions of galaxies. It's almost, I mean, it is. It's too big to even comprehend. I mean, you try to think, can I comprehend God? You cannot even, and I cannot even comprehend the universe. It has been estimated that the universe, if you wanted to get from one end of the universe to the other, it would take you 90 billion light years to do it. At the speed of light, it would take you 90 billion years to get from one end of this uh, universe to the other. And here's what's amazing. The scriptures say that creation was nothing, nothing at all for God to accomplish. It was nothing. He simply spoke it. Jeremiah, he said this to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? The answer, of course, is no. There is nothing too hard for God to accomplish. And the universe itself is testimony to just how almighty, almighty God really is. Now, incidentally, and this is a side note, I'm often asked, what is my personal view of Genesis 1-1? This is a community non-denominational church, so we have a lot of views here, uh, a lot of different understandings of Genesis 1-1, but I do want to share with you my mind is that if you read Genesis chapter 1, a straightforward reading of Genesis 1 clearly teaches, in my opinion, that God created everything in six literal 24-hour days. Again, a testimony to how almighty the almighty truly is. Remember, if God had wanted to, he could have created everything in one day. As a matter of fact, God could have created everything in one second or one millionth of a second or one trillionth of a second. He could have done that. But the Bible says he did it in six days, in my opinion. Six literal 24-hour days. The question is, why did he do it that way? Why six days? Well, the book of Exodus gives us an answer. It says this, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day uh, is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, uh, the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So yes, creation is truly a testimony to how almighty God Almighty is. Creation was a miraculous event. It was a series of supernatural events that happened over a six-day period in this pastor's opinion. Throw into this discussion the fact that in Genesis chapter 5, in Genesis chapter 11, you have genealogies running from Adam Name by name by name, all the way down to Abraham. So yes, this, this pastor believes that the world was created in six literal days, and he also believes that the earth is very, very young. Is very, very young. And if you disagree with me, like I always say, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what the Bible says. <laughs> Don't write me any communication cards, please. I understand that is not the church's official position. We are a non-denominational community church. That's, I was just giving you my opinion. And since they gave me the pulpit, you're going to get my opinion <laughs> from time to time. Um, even how God Almighty created you is a testimony to his supremacy and to his might and to his awesomeness. Right? Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Again, when you stop to consider how amazing the human body is, you cannot help but reflect on how almighty God truly is. That is why when a child is born, we say it's a miracle. Even those that don't believe in a God will you find themselves saying, wow, that was a miracle. You are a miracle. You were created in God's image. And it is a testimony to his almightiness. And your soul knows it full well. Your soul knows it full well. We know that there is something fundamentally special about humans above all other life forms. We understand that there is something different about human beings over lions. And as tragic as it was that Cecil the lion was killed, I think it was kind of a tragedy, sad. But we understand that if a human had been murdered, it would have been a different situation. And why? Because we know in our hearts that there's something different about mankind. Our soul knows very well that mankind is special. We were created in his image and it is a testimony to God's awesomeness. 
I was just talking to someone the other day about, we were marveling about how you can cut your hand. You know, you're making breakfast and you cut your finger. And one week later, that says, as if nothing happened. Why is that? Well, the psalmist says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are wonderfully made. That when your body gets hurt, it repairs itself. Folks, that is a testimony to how awesome God is and how almighty he is. Now, at this point, it is very critical that we understand a principle. And the principle is this, okay? The builder is always worthy of more honor than the building. Okay, the builder is always worthy of more honor than the building. That's the principle. Look at Hebrews 3.3. It says this, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So the writer of Hebrews is contrasting Moses and Jesus. And then he says this, As the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. The builder always has more honor than the building. Always. The point is simple. As awesome and magnificent and as mighty as creation is, we must always be careful never to honor the creation more than the creator. The universe is big, but God is bigger. The universe is beautiful, but God is more beautiful. The universe is awesome, but God is more awesome. The Sistine Chapel is worthy of honor. It is one of the true, great human works of mankind. And by the way, you would never look at the Sistine Chapel and go, boy, that just happened by accident. Of course not. You would be insane to think that. The Sistine Chapel is worthy of honor. Again, it is one of the great works but more honor is due to the one who painted it, Michelangelo, right? Always. And as great as the universe is, it points to something far greater. As mighty as the universe it is, it points to one who is almighty. An all-powerful, omnipotent, supremely magnificent, very great God. A God who just through his act of speaking, brings into existence the universe. And when you look at the universe, you should stand in fear, in awe of the one who created it. That is how almighty God Almighty is. Amen? That's how almighty he is. This is the one the Bible calls El Shaddai. El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is the chief builder. He is the master painter. And that which is created serves one overarching purpose. You understand this. God created you for a reason. What is your overarching purpose? Your overarching purpose is to bring glory to the one that created you. To bring glory and honor to the one that created you. That is why God put us in the universe. Isaiah, in speaking to the Israelites, he reminded them why God called them and created them. The people whom I formed, that is the Israelites, for myself, that they might declare my praise. That's why, Israel, you were called out of all the nations. That is why I called you. That is why I put you on this earth. Nehemiah says this, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made the heavens, the heavens of heavens with all their hosts. The earth and all that is on it. The sea and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the hosts of heaven worship you. You will remember that when Jesus entered Jerusalem and people were praising his names, the Pharisees tried to rebuke Jesus, telling him, make your disciples be quiet. And Jesus answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. All of creation exists for one overarching purpose, and that is to magnify and exalt the Lord God Almighty in every way we can. In every way we can. We see this in the book of Revelation. This is exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. <laughs> In other words, praise be to the almighty, supreme, omnipotent, very great, glorious God of the universe. God is the almighty one. He is the El Shaddai. And we, his creation, are to bear testimony to that. Now, sadly, however, mankind has a tendency, listen to this, 
Remember the building principle. I just taught it to you. What is the building principle? The builder is always worthy of more honor than the building. Okay? Here's the problem. Mankind has a tendency to invert the building principle. Okay, we have a tendency to invert the building principle. Mankind, because of our sinful nature, has a horrible tendency to honor that which is created more highly than the one who created it. That's inverting the building principle. The things that become almighty in our life are the things that were created by the almighty himself. We get enamored with the beauty of created things. You will remember, and maybe you don't know this, but... It was Satan himself. This was the downfall of Satan. He inverted the building principle. He, inverted, he, he became enamored with his own beauty. Ezekiel describes the fall of Satan. I want to read it to you. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the Garden of Eden. You were anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. And you are on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. How beautiful Lucifer must have been. I mean, he was the signet of perfection, glorious. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. And then just two verses later, it says, Your heart was proud because of your beauty. Satan inverted the building principle. As beautiful and as magnificent as Lucifer was when he was first created, the one that created it was worthy of more honor. Always. Always. And it says this, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your own splendor. Inverting of the building principle. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before the kings to feast their eyes on you. Satan, again, was originally the most beautiful of God's creation, but he, get, he became fixated on himself. The Almighty in Satan's life became himself. And that is the danger, is that when the things that have been created become the Almighty things in our life, we have inverted the building principle, the builder principle. And it is no wonder that when God spoke to Moses, he led the people out of Israel uh, out of Egypt, and he led them to Mount Sinai. And Moses went up on Mount Sinai. And the Bible says he was a long time in coming back. Um, but while he was there, God gave him the law. He spoke to him the law. And the first commandment is this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. And the second is like this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Now at this point, I need to teach you another very important principle. Do not ever forget the building principle, the builder principle, okay? The, the, building, the builder is always worthy of more honor than the building. Here's a very another, another important principle you must know. It's a biblical principle. You've known this principle from the time you were a child. You just didn't know necessarily, maybe, that it was a biblical principle, and it is simply this. It is the monkey see, monkey do principle, right? It is the monkey see, monkey do principle. Why do people tend to worship that which is created over the one that created it? Why does that which has been created become almighty in our lives and we forget about the almighty one who created those things? Well, it is the monkey see, monkey do principle. This is what happened to the nation of Israel. They despised his statutes and his covenants that he made with their fathers. This is what Israel did with God. And the warnings that he gave them, they went after false idols and became false. And they followed the nations around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded that they should not be like them. Folks, we live in a world that loves to worship created things. Things made by the hands of men. We live in an idolatrous world. And I say this with all due respect to America because we're always supposed to speak highly of America, but we live in an idolatrous country. We live in an idolatrous country. And again, remember I told you when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, he was a long time in coming back after receiving the law. And the Bible says that while he was a long time in coming back, Aaron, 
who was down leading the people of Israel, took gold and he formed an idol. He made a calf and he told the people, here is your God. And they bowed down to that calf and a great abomination occurred that day. But let's not be surprised. Idolatry goes all the way back to Moses. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve and it goes all the way back to Satan himself. It goes back to Satan himself. But let's get back to us. Never has there been a time in world history that there is more shiny, glittery, fancy things made by the hands of men as there is right now. You live in that world. You know, we often look at the Christians that lived in other generations and we say, man, they lived in tough generations. We live in a tough generation, folks. There are idols all around you. They abound everywhere. Listen, folks, the last thing the world needs from the children of God is a church and a people who are copying the world. That is the last thing they need. The world needs to see a church whose greatest love is the Lord God Almighty. The world needs to see a church whose only God is the Lord God Almighty. That's what the world needs from us. The world needs us to point to the Almighty One and say, you give Him the praise at all times and in all ways. I love what it says in 1 Kings. It says, the people of the earth, that the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Let your heart therefore be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments. That is what we are called to do. By the way, um, you know who um, suffers um, when we lose our focus and we begin to worship the things of this world, it is our children. It is our children. Second King says this, so the people feared the Lord and they also served the carved images. They had one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. They had one eye on God and one eye on the world. So the people feared the Lord and served the carved images. Their children did likewise and their children's children, as their fathers did so they do to this day. Children copy what they see their elders doing. That's the monkey see, monkey do principle, folks. Listen, if we copy the nations around us, be certain that our children will copy us. If we take our eyes off Almighty God, the creator of the universe, and put them on created things, you can be certain your children will do the same. You want to know what the future of your children and your grandchildren is going to be like? Simply look at what your heart is devoted to today. That's it. It's that simple. You go, well, I wonder if my children and my grandchildren are going to have what their future is going to be like. I would simply say, what is your heart devoted to today? What has your heart today, your attention and your affection and your love? What do you worship above all things? Is there something that has come to possess you, a possession of yours that has come to possess you? Is there someone that you honor and revere more than the Lord God Almighty? These are the questions we have to ask. Folks, there is only one Almighty he is the almighty God. He is the El Shaddai. He is the creator of the universe. He is awesome in splendor and in his majesty. And it is our job to worship and lift his name on high because if we don't, the rocks will cry out in our place. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you are El Shaddai. You are the mighty God creator of the universe. And Lord, we look at this universe and we, we stand in awe. It is amazing to think how big and how vast it is. And Lord, yet we're reminded that it was nothing for you. You spoke this into existence. God, how mighty and awesome you truly are. And Lord, I pray, I pray for anything, God, that has our hearts today. Anything that has our hearts and our attention and our affections more than you, Father, that we ask, we beg that you would strip these things from us. And God, that we would be focused on you, the Almighty One, enamored with you. And Lord, we thank you. We just thank you for your grace because we often are distracted. I know I am. 
and I set my heart and my affections on the things of this world. God, we thank you that you are full of grace and mercy in those times. So Lord, we confess, just right now in the quietness of your heart and where you're seated, just spend a moment just in private prayer. Lift to the Lord anything that you need to lift to him. Almighty God, we love you. Amen.